In our last video, we talked about the spiritual gifts and how the purpose of the gifts is to build one another up. In this video, I want to talk about when we meet together, because that's a phrase that Paul uses over and over again in these chapters. And these chapters, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, that talk about the spiritual gifts are very misunderstood in a lot of ways. One of those ways is that people read these chapters and they come to the conclusion that not everyone has every gift. And that's actually very common in the church. Most people have the opinion that, okay, I have the gift of tongues, but I don't have the gift of prophecy, or I have the gift of prophecy, but I don't have the gift of tongues, or I have the gift of teaching, but I don't have the gift of healing, or whatever, what have you. A lot of people have this opinion that, okay, well, I don't have that gift. And I want to talk about this because it's really taking this whole section out of context. And that whole idea is based on these verses alone. It's not something found really elsewhere in the Bible. It's, it's taking these verses and saying, well, see, not everyone has every gift. I'll start off by reading the verse that everyone bases that on. There's actually a few, but this is a good summary. This is at the end of chapter 12, starting in verse 27 through the end of the chapter. Together you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of that body. In the church, God has given a place first to apostles, second to prophets, and third to teachers. Then those who do miracles, those who have gifts of healing, those who can help others, those who are able to govern, and those who can speak in different languages. Not all are apostles, not all are prophets, not all are teachers, not all do miracles, not all have gifts of healing, not all speak in different languages, not all interpret those languages, but you should truly want to have the greater gifts. People look at this and they say, see, not everyone can speak in tongues, not everyone can prophesy, not everyone can heal. But here's the problem. Starting all the way back in chapter 11, verse 17, Paul said, In the things I tell you now, I do not praise you, because when you meet together, you do more harm than good. He then continues talking about the Lord's Supper, and people kind of just assume that when he said that, he was only talking about what he says in the rest of that chapter. And that's because we break things up into chapters and verses, and Paul didn't do that. Throughout the rest of 12, 13, and 14, he is still talking about when you meet together. And I'm just going to read a few verses to back that up. Because in chapter 12, he goes on talking about the spiritual gifts. In chapter 13, he explains that the spiritual gifts should be defined by love. And in chapter 14, he continues talking about the spiritual gifts. So these three chapters are all one unit. But in chapter 14, he's making it clear that it's still in the context of when you meet together. In chapter 14, I read this in the last video, 1 through 17, Paul is talking about how you should desire to have prophecy rather than tongues because prophecy helps build up the church. In verse 18, he says, I thank God that I speak in different kinds of languages more than all of you, but in the church meetings, I would rather speak five words I understand in order to teach others than thousands of words in a different language. That makes it clear that everything else in chapter 14, at least, was under the header of in a church meeting. Because all throughout chapter 14, he's saying, you should desire prophecy and not tongues, prophecy and not tongues. And here he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than everyone. But in a church meeting, I would rather help people than speak in tongues. So when he's talking about that, he's talking about in a church meeting. And all of this is still building on chapter 12. When in chapter 12, he said, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. All of this is being built on this premise that it's for the common good. And it's for the common good because it's in the church meeting. And he continues this. Later in chapter 14, he says in verse 26, So, brothers and sisters, what should you do? When you meet together... One person has a song, and another has a teaching. Another has a revelation, another speaks in a different language, and another person interprets that language. 
the purpose of all these things should be to help the church grow strong. Right there, he's saying this is when you meet together. He's been talking about when you meet together since chapter 11. He hasn't diverted from that. It's all in the context of when you meet together, different people have different gifts. Not throughout your entire life, different people have different gifts. When you meet together. He says then, continuing, when you meet together, if anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be only two or not more than three who speak. They should speak one after the other and someone should interpret. But if there is no interpreter, then they should remain silent in the church meeting. They should speak only to themselves and to God. Again, Paul is saying, when you meet together in the church meeting, he's saying, this is for when you are gathered together. This is a theme throughout these chapters. Over and over, he's saying, when you meet together, you should be focused on building one another up. When you meet together, you should be doing these things. When you meet together, the Holy Spirit gives different gifts to different people. He is nowhere saying that in your life, you will never have the gift of tongues or you will never have the gift of healing. That's not what he's saying. He's saying when you come together, different people will have different gifts. All will be given by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit divides these gifts up as he sees fit. But it's not in my life, oh, I don't have the gift of, of tongues. I've heard so many people say that, and it's just not biblical. It's all founded on these verses where Paul is clearly saying that he is talking about during a church meeting, not during your life. To say, I don't have the gift of tongues isn't biblical, because this isn't talking about that. To say, I don't have the gift of healing, it's not biblical. Jesus said, everyone who follows him, everyone who believes, will be able to heal. That's in Mark 16. The gifts of the Spirit are not distributed to individuals for their entire lives. When you meet together, different people have different gifts. But now I want to talk about one of the reasons why this is so confusing. Because the problem is, in church today, we don't do church like they did back then. What we do today is largely not church at all. It's not biblical. It's built on a lot of pagan practices and human traditions, which really it's too much to get into in this video. We're really hoping to do a whole series on that later. But when you go to church on Sunday, you are probably going to see some variant of a general order. Things follow a schedule. Usually it is worship, and then maybe brief prayer, and an offering, and announcements, and then a sermon, which will last for the bulk of the meeting, and then maybe some worship at the end and some prayer. And then you'll be dismissed. That is not from the Bible. That actually largely comes from pagan practices, pagan religions, and human traditions. All things that are condemned in Scripture. Jesus strongly rebuked people for following human traditions rather than God. And scripture is very clear about following pagan practices. We should not be coming to God in a way that is adopting practices from pagan religions. Now, I know a lot of you probably aren't even aware of what the pagan practices are. Again, we are hoping to do a series someday about that. But you can start just researching it yourself. You really can. It's all over the place. You can find it. People talk about it. There are books written about it, videos about it. You can learn. The point being, when they gathered together, their meetings looked very different. When the church in the Bible met together, they didn't have an ordered set of events. They met together as family. They were brothers and sisters, and God was the Father, and the Holy Spirit was the one leading the meeting. Their meetings were not on a schedule which was set by a man, and they followed it week after week after week after week. The Holy Spirit led the meetings. Imagine your pastor is speaking. Imagine your pastor is giving his Sunday sermon. Well, this is what Paul says. If a revelation comes to another person who is sitting, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy one after the other. In this way, all the people can be taught and encouraged. Does your Sunday service at church look like that? If your pastor is speaking, do you have the freedom to stand up 
and begin preaching yourself to share a word that the Holy Spirit is giving you to share. And if you do, will the pastor go quiet and sit down and let you speak? 99.9% .9 of churches out there will not let you do that. If you try to do that, a security team will stand up and grab you and drag you out because they don't want that happening. They have an order of events. And the reason is because they follow man's tradition and not scripture. In the early church, the Holy Spirit was the one leading the meetings. He would give one person a prophecy. He would give another person a revelation. This person would suddenly have a tongue to share and this other person would have the interpretation of that tongue. The Holy Spirit divided the gifts in the meeting and everyone was built up and everyone participated. If you're going to a church where you can't participate, it's not church at all. It's largely pagan and really you should go start looking that up. If you are part of a church, if you are attending a church that is not functioning the way that scripture says a congregation should function, you're not going to grow there. Scripture is clear that we mature through doing. We mature through practice. Hebrews 5 said it's those who mature through constant practice. Constantly doing the word, not just hearing it preached. Paul says in Colossians 2, I want them to be strengthened and joined together with love so that they may be rich in their understanding. This leads to their knowing fully God's secret, that is, Christ himself. Being built together in love, in other words, in action, in participating, will lead you to have understanding and to know God's secret, which is Christ himself. If you are just going and singing songs and sitting there listening to a pastor preach, you are not going to grow in understanding according to scripture because you will mature through doing, not through sitting and listening to a preacher. That's why the early church met together. They didn't meet together in an organized meeting. It was family coming together. They came and they hung out. They had a meal together and they fellowshiped together. And that was their meeting. And the Holy Spirit led the meeting. It's really, the pastor is not in charge of leading a meeting. Biblically, the pastor has no authority to run the meeting. He can help facilitate people getting together. And his job is to help others grow. But his job is not to run the meeting. Scripture is clear that Christ is the head of the body. He is the head of the church. Even the word church in your Bible comes from the Greek word ekklesia. I might be pronouncing that wrong. But in the Greek that was originally written, they didn't write church because they wrote in Greek. They wrote ekklesia. But ekklesia does not mean church. Church is not even a biblical word. Ekklesia means congregation or those who have been called out. Because through Jesus, we have been called out of slavery to sin. Just like in the Old Testament, God referred to the Israelites as the congregation or those who have been called out. They used the Hebrew equivalent, but it was the same meaning. It was different language, but same meaning. Congregation, those who have been called out because they were called out of slavery in Egypt and they were being led to the promised land. And for us, we were called out of slavery to sin and we are being led to the promised land. This is actually a common theme all throughout the New Testament and it sheds a lot of light on what Christianity is supposed to be. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is talking about the Israelites in the wilderness after they were called out of slavery in Egypt. He's drawing a lot of connections about how their lives are similar to our lives in the church age. And he actually says, the things that happen to those people are examples. They were written down to teach us for whom the culmination of the ages has come. What's he saying? The culmination of the ages is basically referring to the age of the Messiah, age of Jesus. Scripture says that Jesus came at the culmination of time or at the climax of time. There are different ways you could translate it. But he's saying these things that happened to the Israelites in the wilderness were written down to teach those who live in the church age. Because just like the Israelites were brought out of slavery in Egypt, we were brought out of slavery to sin. And when we read their stories, 
there is a parallel. We're supposed to learn from their stories so that we don't make the same mistakes that they made. Anyway, that was all kind of a tangent, but here's my point. Just like they were a congregation, they were the people called out. We are a people who are called out. That's what the word church, when you see the word church, that's what it actually means. It's not supposed to say church. It's supposed to say congregation or those who have been called out. And in scripture, it says that Christ is the head of those who have been called out. He is the head of the congregation. He is the one who is supposed to be leading, not the pastors. Christ is the one who, when you meet together, the spirit of Christ, the spirit distributes the gifts to different people for different purposes. When you meet together, there shouldn't be an organized series of events. If you have that when you meet together, it's religion. It's not biblical. It's not Christianity. That's not how they did things. And you can't grow in that. When you are practicing the gifts, you are practicing love because the gifts are all about other people. And Paul says, in again, in Colossians 2, that if you are practicing love, that will cause you to grow in understanding. That will cause you to understand the secret, which is Christ himself. You grow through living in love. You grow through practicing love. And if you are in a church that's not letting you do that, you are not going to grow. And no one else is going to grow either. No one else is, there is going to grow. You're not even able to help them. I mean, it's not even... You know, the spiritual gifts are for you to help others, but you're not even able to help others. More than that, you yourself are not growing. This idea that people need to hear preaching over and over and over again, we often think <clears throat> that that's what they did in the Bible, but that's not what they did. Paul just described, again, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, he described what their meetings looked like. Everyone was participating. It wasn't focused around the preaching. That was an idea that Martin Luther introduced into the church. Martin Luther came along and he said, preaching is the primary way that God speaks to his people. And that is how the church has done it ever since. But that's not how they did it in scripture. Scripture does not say you will grow through preaching. Scripture says you will grow through practicing love. And the, one of the primary ways to practice love is through practicing the spiritual gifts when you meet together. If you are not able to practice the spiritual gifts when you meet together, you're not doing what you're supposed to do when you meet together. A lot of people defend the church meetings that are done today by saying, well, Hebrews 10 says that we should not neglect to meet together. For reference, that, that verse is Hebrews 10, 25. You should not neglect meeting together as some are doing. But that's also plucked out of context. Because when you meet together, you should be doing what the verse right before that says. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us think about how to provoke one another to show love and do good deeds. You should not neglect meeting together as some are doing, but you should encourage each other and even more so as you see the day coming. Today in the church, people say we shouldn't neglect meeting together, and so they just go through this church ritual, which is really just religion, and they think that they're fulfilling this verse. But you're not fulfilling that verse if you're not doing what the Bible says you're supposed to be doing when you meet together. You're supposed to be meeting together to provoke and encourage one another to love and good deeds. In 1 Corinthians, it's clear you're supposed to be meeting together and practicing the spiritual gifts and building one another up. Everyone should be participating because that's how people grow. If you're going to church on Sunday, week in and week out, and you're just following a set schedule by a, that was determined by a man... You're not doing what Hebrews 10 says to do. You're still not meeting together in the way it says to, to meet. You're not growing and the church around you is not growing. We put this emphasis on we need to be taught. We need to be taught. But let me read you a verse in Hebrews 5. He's talking about a different topic, but then he pauses and he says, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are so slow to understand. By now, you should be teachers. But you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of God's message. You still need the teaching that is like milk. You're not ready for solid food. 
Anyone who lives on milk is still a baby and inexperienced with the message about righteousness. But solid food is for those who are mature, who, through practice, have trained their senses to know the difference between good and evil. The mature are growing through practice. Some translations say constant practice. But those who are immature are trying to grow through teaching. Do you see the difference? Practice means you are doing. You are doing, you are doing, you are doing, and as you do, you grow. Teaching, you are sitting and you are listening. You are listening, you are listening, you are listening, and you are not growing according to Scripture. James says the same thing. Don't be a hearer only, but be a doer. If you are a hearer only, you're deceiving yourself. According to Scripture, you grow through doing. You grow through practicing. Think of it this way. This concept is actually very common to the human life. Everything we do, we grow through doing and not just listening. The Christian life is often compared to becoming a baby, becoming a child, and growing through maturity. Even this verse here in Hebrews is calling it immaturity versus maturity. He said, you're still a baby, you still need milk, but you should be mature. Does a baby learn how to walk by having someone tell them over and over again how to walk? No, a baby learns how to walk by trying. Or think of it this way. For me, my secular work career has been in the printing industry. Now, I won't bore you with all the details, but here's the thing. My first day on the job, I knew nothing. I didn't go to school for this. I hadn't been trained for it. I knew nothing. I showed up to work and my boss didn't give me a book to read. He didn't sit there and just tell me everything all at once. No, he gave me this printed graphic. It was this decal that was going to go on the side of a truck. He handed it to me and he said, go on this job site and stick this on the side of the truck. And he briefly explained to me how to do it. And then he sent me out. And you know what happened? I came back and I was like, the graphics crooked. <laughs> and so then we had to redo it and he sent me out again and I got it right. And everything I learned, I learned through doing, not through being told. I would be told, but then I had to do. It wasn't one without the other. I would hear how to do it, and then I would try it. And sometimes I'd get it right the first time. But often I wouldn't get it right the first time. And over time, I became good at my job. But my first day there, I was not good at my job. Honestly, the first year there, I wasn't that great at my job. <laughs> But over time, I learned, and eventually I reached the point where I worked my way up through the company until I was running the whole shop. I was the manager of the entire shop. It was because I learned how to do it by doing it. I didn't learn by just being told. And that's very common for people. We learn best by doing, not by just hearing. So all of that to come back to this. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, Paul is describing what it should look like when we meet together. When we meet together, everyone should be participating. If you are part of a congregation where you are not allowed to participate, where the Holy Spirit cannot tell you to stand up and say something because you are not allowed, honestly, you need to just leave and go find a congregation that you can do that. You will most likely never find that in a traditional church with a building and with a pastoral team. Most of the time you will find that by finding other like-minded believers who want the same thing and you just start meeting together in homes. That is also biblical. They met in homes. They didn't have buildings. They did life together every day. They met together every day. That is what the Christian life is like. It's community. It's family. It's not religion. It's not having a building and going to a meeting. It's getting together with all your friends for a meal and then praying together and the Holy Spirit just moves and starts using you and, and you grow through that, through loving one another. That's what it's supposed to be like. So if you're not part of that, then start trying to find that. Because that's how you're going to grow. You're not going to grow through just listening to preaching. You're not going to grow if you can't practice it yourself. If you want to grow 
in prophesying. How are you going to do that if you go to a church that doesn't let you prophesy? If you want to grow in teaching, how are you going to do that in a church that doesn't let you teach? You will grow when you practice. So find a way to practice. That's what the early church looked like. When they met together, the Spirit divided these gifts. And the reason we today think that the gifts are for individuals for their whole life and not for separate meetings is because we don't have meetings where the Holy Spirit divides the gifts. And so then we have people saying, well, I don't have the gift of healing. Well, you've never been in a circle where the Holy Spirit has divided up gifts and has given you the gift of healing. Because the gift of healing is not an ability. It is a gift that the Holy Spirit gives you to give to others. When it says gift, we read the word ability into that because we talk about it like, oh, that person's a gifted person. You know, if someone's an athlete, we say, oh, they have the, this gift. We talk about the word gift as if it is this ability, but scripture uses the word gift as in it is a, a gift, a present, a thing that God gives you to give. It is a thing he gives you. And Paul is clearly saying that when he gives you that thing, it's not for you to hold on to for yourself. No, he gives you things for other people and he gives them things for you. That's how the spiritual gifts work because the body is supposed to be building one another up by using the spiritual gifts, by practicing the spiritual gifts, by doing that in love because it's about others and not about yourself. And as you do that, you will grow. You will mature. You will understand Christ. You will understand what the gospel is really about and what it means when it says that Christ is in you. You will begin to understand the fullness of that and all the implications. But it only can happen if you're in a setting that lets you practice and doesn't force you to sit there in a chair and just listen to preaching. That's not Christianity. Just because people call it Christianity doesn't mean it is. Scripture is full of warnings that the church age is going to be full, full of false teachers and false Christians and people who are deceived. Over and over and over again, that is what the warning is. So we can't just define Christianity by what the world tells us Christianity is. They say Christianity means you go to church and you hear preaching and you sing songs, but that's not what the Bible says it is. It's daily life. It's family. It's being children of God and it's growing through loving one another. What is done at church on Sunday, whatever denomination you're part of, if they are following an ordered schedule, what they are doing is not Christianity. It is founded on paganism, the worship of false gods, and it's not biblical. And just because someone says that they are worshiping Jesus does not mean they are worshiping Jesus. That is a theme also throughout the Bible. And it's really too much to get into in this video. It's aside from the point. But the Bible is full of stories where people thought they were worshiping God because they were using his name. Just look at the story where Aaron builds the calf in the wilderness. He says that it's the Lord who brought them out of Egypt, but that doesn't mean it actually is. Just because you use the name Jesus doesn't mean you're worshiping the person Jesus. And that's a whole nother topic for another time. But that is one of the problems in the church. Just because they call themselves Christian doesn't make them Christian. And the Bible is full of warnings that that is what the church is going to look like in the church age. The church age being everything from the time Jesus came the first time to when he returns. The time we live in, the church age, is going to be full of false Christians, false teachers, and a lot of bad teaching, and a lot of misunderstanding, and a lot of people will be deceived. So follow scripture and not human tradition. And if those human traditions aren't matching up with this, then don't do it. Church in scripture is not even church. It's the people who are called out. And when they meet together, it's not an ordered meeting, but it's a fellowship, a family getting together, and the Holy Spirit is leading it, and the Holy Spirit is dividing gifts among them, and everyone is participating and everyone is growing because they are participating. There's no such thing in the Bible as the congregation getting together for a meeting in which they follow a scheduled order of events. Because that's religion and God is never about religion. When the early church got together, they followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that is what it should still be today because nothing has changed. The only thing that has happened 
is that religion has been introduced and people follow religion thinking they're following God. But true Christianity hasn't changed. It should still look exactly like what we read in scripture. And it still happens today.